hush has fallen over the audience. How come? Something about to happen? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 27th Annual Historic Preservation Awards sponsored by the Manchester Historic Association. It's wonderful to be back here at the Dana Center again this year, and we appreciate St. Anselm College making us feel so welcome. My name is Ed Bruder, and until six days ago, uh, I was the president of the Manchester Historic Association. But right now, I'd like to introduce you to our brand new board chair, Colleen Kurlansky. Thank you, Ed. And thank you for the dedication and commitment during your tenure as president. You have set the bar so high, I've got very good shoes to fill. Good evening. On behalf of the Manchester Historic Association, it is my honor to welcome you all tonight to our 27th Annual Historic Preservation Awards. This event has grown significantly over the years with a record crowd of over 400 tonight. Wow. <laughs> this growth is in part to our supporters, so thank you all for being here and supporting us in our mission to collect, preserve, and share the history of Manchester. Your support is vital and very much appreciated. In a short bit, we'll hear more about how your support positively impacts our entire community. I would also like to extend congratulations to all of this year's award recipients and the Century Club Award recipients as well. Please also let me take a moment to introduce our new trustees and ask if they would all please stand. They are Deborah Blondin. co-chairs for this evening's event. That would be Laura Gamache, if you would please stand. They have gone above and beyond in their efforts to make this event this evening top notch. So without further ado, I will pass the podium back to Ed and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you again for being here. mom again any second, like really any second. And I just want to say that if you don't have it during the ceremony, I'm out of the pool, so <laughs> go team. Well, when, these, when we chose this year's honorary chair, I thought, oh my God, I'll never learn to spell his name. But I did. It's A-L-B-U-Q-U-E-R-Q-U-E, -E, Matt Albuquerque. Um, and I learned how to use it in a sentence. Matt Albuquerque has done an extraordinary job attending meetings, writing letters, making phone calls, and generating ideas to make tonight's event a success. Matt, of course, is the founder and president of Next Step Bionics and Prosthetics in the Mill Yard, and I'm sure he'll also recognize his administrative assistant, Susan Gelinas, for the help she's given us, but it gives me great pleasure to introduce our honorary chair for the night, Matt Albuquerque. Thank you and welcome to the 27th Annual Historic Preservation Awards. I'd like to take a, a moment to tell you a quick story about how I ended up being the honorary chairman tonight. I was at a charity event of, over a year ago and John Clayton was the MC. It was about 10 minutes before the start of the event and I noticed John weaving through the crowd with his finger up like he wanted to talk to me. And he's coming at me like a freight train. I could tell he wanted something, I could see the look in his eyes. 
He was in a rush, so when we met up, the only words I think I heard him say was like, a store rep, fundraiser, chairman. And as he's walking away, he says, and you're going to be great at it. <laughs> this is very confusing to me, because what I'm great at is making arms and legs, okay? Make no mistake about it. At the time, <clears throat> honestly, I knew about the Milliard Museum and John's involvement with it, but I didn't know much about the Manchester Historic Association and the depths of what they do. It was really through some self-reflection that the meeting became clear. Flashback to the early 80s, when I used to drive over the Ambuscade Bridge on my way to Trinity High School. I vividly remember looking down the Merrimack River at all the buildings in complete disarray, with broken out windows. I used to think of how sad it was that this happened to an area which, at one point in time, was the largest producer of textiles in the world. About two weeks or so after John asked me to chair this event, it was a real busy week at Next Step, and I was heading into the office really early, so early in fact it was still dark out. As I drove across the Ambuscade Bridge and looked down the Merrimack River, instead of seeing the disarray I used to see in the 80s, all I could see was this one row of lights gleaming in one of the many wonderfully restored mill buildings which are now part of this incredible ecosystem of businesses, schools, and medical research institutions, which is sitting in this great city that means so much to me. <clears throat> I soon realized that that one row of lights was mine. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, I had left all the lights on it next to <laughs> being upset that somebody left the lights on, I came to the realization, and I had this incredible rush of pride, knowing that Next Step and the Bionics and Process had played an important part in the revitalization of the mill yard, as seen as an integral part of this med-tech designation given to us, but most importantly, the positive recognition that it gives for Manchester, New Hampshire. As I was starting to get all sentimental, I started to think of how cool it's going to be for my kids and future generations of Albuquerque to know about Next Step of Bionics and Prosthetics and the role it played in the recovery of the mill yard. I know my friends, family, and supporters are very proud of what we've done. As I'm thinking about this and I'm driving over the bridge, it hit me like a ton of bricks. That's what the association does. As a community, we're extremely lucky to have such a wonderful organization with a dedicated group of really hardworking employees that has saved remnants of the past and documents the present to make sure there is a history for future generations to look back on and com comprehend what it took to get Manchester back to the thriving city and the amazing place that it is today. All of us need to support this important mission, and your attendance here tonight shows that we feel the same way. I'd like to give you my sincere thanks and appreciation for that. You all deserve a round of applause. Thank you. Very much. I'd like to take, thank the fantastic committee um, that I was privileged to work with to put together this event together tonight. Uh, if you could stand up and be recognized, I'm going to ask you to hold off applause because we've got a few names here, but uh, it really does take a lot of people uh, to put an event like this on. I'm going to start off uh, with John Clayton, Ed Brodeur, Richard Bunker, Colleen Karlansky, Christy Ellsworth, Shannon Sullivan, Daniel Peters, Josh Hamill, Jeff Faircloth, my assistant and committee member, J Sue Gelinas, and last but certainly not least, our co-chairs, Laura Gamash and Gary Moore. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> John Clayton, um, thank you so much for asking me to chair this event. It's been a, a great experience. But more importantly, thank you for being the champion you are as the person who is passionate about always showing Manchester, New Hampshire in its brightest light at a time when it is so desperately needed. Thank you, John, very much. <laughs> to 
interesting to thank you again for your support. And as, as I look around this room, I know many of you are inundated with requests to support different charities. Thank you for choosing us today. I hope you can all join us after this for dessert. God bless and thank you very much. coming doing this. I think everybody in New Hampshire probably knows our next speaker, the executive director of the association, John Clayton. It's always a treat for me to be back on the campus of San Antonio College uh, because it was here that I had my first job. My father was a plumber on the maintenance crew and when I was a freshman at West High School, it was near the end of the school year, he came home after work and said, I got your job at St. Anselm. I'm freshman in high school, I'm 14, thinking, I'm going to be the youngest tenured professor in the history of St. Anselm College. And then I showed up on campus and they showed me the lawnmower. <laughs> so much for my career in academics. Um, but it's great to be back on campus here at the Vanna Center, and we thank our host, St. Anselm College, for being such gracious hosts for us. Uh, we are supported by some major important sponsors who make this event possible, including RBC Wealth Management, uh, the Hood Wealth Solutions Group, Spectrum Marketing Companies, People's United Bank, Central Paper Products, Eastern Bank, New Hampshire, Next Step Bionics and Prosthetics, and that's not an honorary chair, he's involved up to his neck, uh, the Puritan Backroom Restaurant, Southern New Hampshire University, St. Mary's Bank, and we want to offer a very special thanks to Jacques Flowers. Uh, if you had come here three hours ago, you would have been thankful we were standing in an industrial uh, room that was not suitable for this kind of a gathering. Uh, within an hour, they turned this space and the Davison Hall uh, into a Garden of Eden. And Ed, I guess that means if I'm Adam. <laughs> I did receive a very nice uh, note today from Chris Pappas, uh, your U.S. Representative in Congress. Uh, Chris is a very important person to the Manchester Historic Association, uh, having served as our treasurer before he had this silly idea about seeking federal office, which he achieved. Uh, the note's a little bit long, but I thought you would be appreciative of one of his sentiments. Uh, Manchester is more than just my hometown. It's a rich and diverse history, helped to guide me as a young man into an adult that appreciates a city that was built by hard work, innovation, community, and family values. I know these things are to, are to be because of the great work and the stewards of our past, like those here tonight, have done to remind us of where we came from. This sense of civic responsibility and duty continues to preserve all that we have built in a way that informs us as a people and as a community. So we want to acknowledge Chris Pappas, uh, who is obviously doing his work in Washington for us, uh, and wishes he could be here with us today. You may have, uh, yes, thank you for this. Very nice to
short. Job thing. I'm going to get the job thing. You've got to be careful when you give him a microphone. Well, actually, John's going to stay on stage for a few minutes because the Manchester Historic Association has so much going on right now that we felt that it would take both of us to really explain all about that. If you were here last year, you may remember that the Manchester Rotary Club presented us with a $15,000 grant that would allow us to reach more fourth graders with local history programs at the New York Museum. And thanks in large part to the Rotary, through the end of April of this year, we've had 1,195 kids visit the museum compared to only 737 a year ago. <laughs> and it's not just kids who are visiting. Through the end of April, uh, the number, total number of audience uh, members, visitors to the museum, was 1,177 compared to just 536 by April of 2018. We've also promoted the museum's Discovery Gallery as a popular rental destination for weddings, business retreats, meetings, and community gatherings. In the past 12 months, we've nearly tripled our rental income. We've done some one-of-a-kind things, like promoting and welcoming the crew of the USS Manchester, the Navy's newest ship, and where is my button? Which I have it on today. <laughs> Still involved. They may be recruiting you for service soon. Uh, we present all manner of interesting talks and guest speakers throughout the year, and our audiences keep getting bigger and bigger. Our presentations have included Civil War reenactors, lost love letters from World War II, covered bridges, Russian immigrants, and my favorite, the always popular hair tasting ones. Our temporary exhibits have continued to draw large crowds throughout this last year. Our current exhibit, Hats Off to Manchester, is open now through August 1st, so if you get a chance, stop by. And we don't just stay inside the museum. We take history to the streets with our wildly successful walking tours. Mark the calendar for Saturday, July 27th, a walking tour of Manchester's Hebrew Cemetery. And you should see some of the historic artifacts we collect. After all, our mission is to collect, preserve, and share the history of Manchester. We hope you agree that we are doing a fantastic job. But good things do come in place. And to that end, we'd like to give you an opportunity to help us. Uh, to start that process, we need to acknowledge a very generous donation from tonight's matching sponsor, uh, People's United Bank. Uh, Diane Mercer has been a long supporter of ours. They pledged $3,500. So if we can raise $3,500 from you, our live audience, uh, People's United Bank has pledged to match that $3,500. Rob, if we could bring the house lights up. So at this point in the program, um, we'd like to do a little business. And probably everybody expects this to come in an event of this type. So do you want to start with the star explanation? Yes. We are going to start the bidding at the uh, pledges at the $1,000 level. And if someone agrees to pledge at that level, you're going to get a very colorful star, which you can redeem as you leave this evening and make your payment at the same time. If you so look at this as easy for you as we can. We have people stationed on this side. I don't know if there are people on that side with stars as well. There are. So if you would like to stand, and um, they will have a star. If you make a pledge at that level, they'll give you the star. And at the end of the night, out in the front lobby, you redeem the star, do your business with the credit card. We'll be very happy, and I think you will be too. And we would like you to keep your hand in the air until you're handed that star. Think about it as your moment in the spotlight. Everyone will be looking at you and recognizing your generosity and the constant support of the Manchester Historic Association. In fact, don't just raise your hand. Stand up. So, Ed, go. <laughs> All right, I guess we are going to start at the $1,000 level. So what color is the $1,000 star? Gold. It is gold. So do we have any of these that we would like to? We have a gentleman in the top row here sitting next to Tony Pappas. I don't recognize the gentleman, but thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Thank you. You have been starred. We have one right here in the front row, our honorary chairman, Matt Albuquerque. Thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody can come down to the very oh, first row. One. Oh, somebody on this side. Thank you very much. That will get us to the National Dance for Diane Mercer. So next time you see Diane, uh, kind of make sure you buy her a beer or a cup of coffee, all right? Or at least open a savings account. Yes, or we'll open a savings account. <laughs> Anybody else that feels they can do to donate at the $1,000 level tonight? All right, I don't see one. Thank you. You can always come see us afterwards. We'd be happy to, to deal with you in private. 
<laughs> so what's our next level? Uh, we're going to go to 500. That seems logical. And what is the color of the $500 star? Silver. Silver, Silver star. Since it's kind of emerging here. Silver stars for $500 donations. Top row in the uh, the second section. If somebody is going up there, okay. this gentleman's going to make oh. a long trip. Thank you, sir. We Good appreciate morning. that. We, we have another one right here at the end of this row. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. $500 donations. We have another one in the, the top. In fact, I think maybe we've just had two up in that section. We're doing very well above the... Please keep your hands up. Yes, please. Uh, can I... Mr. Clayton, you yeah, have a $500 yeah. donation, certainly, yeah. <laughs> I can see he'll be going before the board for a $500 raise. <laughs> Is there anybody else at the $500 level? Anybody else that would like to make a donation? We have another lady in the uh, in the upper section here. This is like, a, these would be the nosebleed seats at the Boston Garden, right? And yet yeah, there's so much money up there. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> anybody else at 500 Right here. Yes. New board member Danny Leach. Thank you, Danny. Appreciate that. Thank you. Five hundred dollars going once, going twice, gone. Okay. As we approach the two hundred and fifty dollar level, we have another yep. strong supporter who we're going to invite to the stage to take over my microphone. I don't do that lightly. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Ron Cutting from St. Mary's Bank. to uh, donate, but just in case you do, we have these nice gift bags, and everyone that's already donated will be getting one of these, which includes a uh, ornament that was uh, developed specifically for tonight's occasion, as well as gift certificates from several of our sponsors in our laundry, in our chop house, uh, third and back room, and several other little things in the goodie bags. So everybody that will donate from this point at $250 and above will get one of these gift bags uh, on their way out. So. If we can start at the 250 one. All right. We have one right here in the front row. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. You'll get a red star. Craig Dane in the middle here. And I see Bonnie Doherty in the row behind him. And I see Selma Nakash Hoff. Thank you. And Deb Blonde, your hand is up too. Thank you very much. Another brand new member of our board. Jackie. Trent right here from High Noon. Uh, board member Jeffrey Burnett. You know what? I'll throw a John Clayton book into this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try, to, like don't try to discourage them. <laughs> let, let, let them do. I saw some more hands. Did I see Judy Pence? Your hand went up. Thank you very much. John Gardner, and then that goes against the, the um, wall. Up here, right in front of the soundboard, when you get back on this side, we have Laura Gamache. Oh, yes. Another one in the front oh, row. Ron Covey. Ron Covey. <laughs> Incidentally, Ron Covey came up with the idea last year when he was the honorary chair for the gift bags, and they proved to be so popular last year. They're loaded with stuff. He didn't tell you everything that's in them. There are gift certificates for, for dry cleaning for at least two different restaurants. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of other things in there, too. Including lint chocolates. There you go. In case you didn't take any off the table in your reception. Um, I can catch up. Laura, if you can get his attention, the lady right here, Gail York. Thank you, Gail. Anybody else at the $250 level? One in the back in the top level here. Dan Foreman, thank you so much. Uh, CGI Business Solutions is the sponsor of Manchester Public Radio and Television, who we'll be recognizing later today. And I want to thank Dan uh, for supporting them, and they support us. And Dan's here supporting us as well. Thank you so much. Oh, Jason Cody. Another one right up front. Speaking of Manchester Public Television Service. Jason, thank you very much. And again, you. if there are others who would like to give in private, you can see any one of our staff outside at the table in the front lobby at the end of the evening. Thank you all very much. And again, this is all part of the, uh, the uh, People's United Bank. They make a, a matching donation for what you contribute. They'll match that. And we thank you all very much for supporting the MHA tonight. What's that level? We missed the $100 level in a blue star. I'm saying we can back it up. Hit rewind. I skipped the whole color. <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer at the $100 level? Collect a blue star. We have one upstairs. Right next to you. There you go. Thank you, Gloria. Appreciate that. We have one right here. Adele, thank you very much. Oh, right here in the front row? Yeah. 
I see Mike Duffy, who is a member of the Historic Preservation Selection Committee. Thank you, Mike, for your support all these years. I see another couple up behind you here. I see somebody in the back row with a hand waving, but you're in the shadow. And I get somebody with a little blank roof, but I can't see who it is. Uh, reach up behind you. There's a star descending on you now. <laughs> We should point out that the star right there was at Abigail York some years ago when we had our event at the uh, Masonic Temple. It was a spectacular event. It was 90 degrees that night. Uh, there's no air conditioning in the Masonic Temple, by the way. Uh, so I think people wanted to pledge just so they could use the star as a fan. I was waiting to get yourself right now. Are there I'll give you that idea. you see others on your side? I do not. And once again, thank you all very much for your support yes. for this tonight. All right, I'd like to ask Matt Albuquerque to come back up again as we start to uh, pass out some awards. We have something called the Century Club, and this is the fifth year that we've recognized businesses and institutions that have reached that magic 100-year mark. It's a pretty rare milestone, and coincidentally tonight we have five inductees in the Century Club. Uh, the first that we're going to start with is Merrimack Street Volvo, and they're no secret, uh, strangers to this event. Um, they were recognized in 2014 for stewardship of the family business started by Morris Seidel a century ago. Accepting the award tonight is Alex Seidel. People are here from Playboy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Coincidentally, we have another automotive dealership, State Motors Lincoln. The Grant family has run this business since, uh, well, 1919. And they started out in South Ware, but of course today they're located on the Daniel Webster Highway in Manchester. Please welcome Doug Grant. somebody else that he's beckoning. <laughs> I suspect this is a family institution. Family of State Motors, my brother Greg, one of my twin sons, Jonathan, Next, we recognize an outstanding local law firm. Back on February 18th of 1919, John R. McLean rented two rooms on the fourth floor of the Amiskeg Bank Building on Elm Street. Today, that firm has more than 100 attorneys in two states and three New Hampshire cities. Accepting the award on behalf of McLean Middleton, PA, is Barry Needleman. Next, we have the happy coincidence of recognizing two American Legion posts celebrating their 100th birthdays. The first is post number two. Private Henry J. Sweeney was a West Side native who died on the battlefield of France in 1918, becoming Manchester's first World War casualty. Today, Sweeney Post is the largest in New Hampshire with more than 1,100 members. Representing them tonight is Al Heidenreich. And while Al is up here, not to be outdone, we're also recognizing Jutra's Post 43 with a Century Club Award. 
chartered on September 12, 1919. The post is named for First Lieutenant William H. Jutras, who also died fighting for his country during the First World War. Thank you both very much, gentlemen. And congratulations to all of our recipients for achieving that century mark. Well, it's often difficult to precisely trace property ownership prior to the arrival of the Amiskeag Manufacturing Company in the 1830s. But I was really excited about this particular property because I was able to track it back to the 18th century. What we identified today as 63 North Adams Street was once part of the vast acreage owned by Major General John Stark of Darrowfield. On March 26, 1774, he sold 138 acres to his Revolutionary War colleague, Colonel John Ray, for 60 pounds. This happened so long ago, America wasn't even using dollars yet. Really, it's on the deed. Ray's name is probably familiar because of Ray Street and Ray Brook, which flows across the southernmost edge of this parcel. After Ray died in 1847, this land was subdivided into smaller and smaller chunks. Finally, in June of 1873, an 11 acre piece was bought by this gentleman, Phineas Adams Sr. He was the company agent of the Stark Mills and a prominent local citizen. Adams lived on Brook Street just off Elm, so he never lived on North Bay Street, let alone farmed there. Though it is likely he leased it to various other farmers. In 1879, Adams convinced the city to cut a road through his 11 acres north to south between Clark and Appleton Streets, and the city even installed a fire hydrant there. Well, one thing you need to understand about North Adams Street, there were three Adams Streets in Manchester during the 1880s. This one that we're awarding in the north end of town, but there was also one on South Main Street near the current West High School, and there was one on the south end in the Bakersville section on the east bank of the Merrimack River. Not to be confused, though, we are talking about the one that Phineas Adams owned. And alas, Phineas died in 1883 and is buried at Pine Grove Cemetery. His widow and children held the 11 acres until June of 1890 when they hired Bartlett, Gay, and Young civil engineers to map out a plan of the Phineas Adams farm consisting of 78 home parcels. Lots 35 and 36 were combined into one 11,000 square foot parcel and the first documented occupants were Lucy and Burton Stewart in 1896. There is no record of the builder, but in 1923, the Victorian Tudor-style house and property were purchased by William F. Laws, and it stayed in the Laws family for the next 87 years. An interesting fact about Mr. Laws is that he was the head of the New Hampshire Concrete Construction Company, and later president of Roby Construction, which might explain two unusual features of the home. One was bright red concrete roof tiles, which added nearly 20 tons of weight to the structure. Reputedly, 63 North Adams was one of only six Manchester homes with concrete roofs. The other unusual feature was this, whatever it is, on the side lawn. <laughs> the current owners didn't even know it was there until they had 18 trees removed after they had purchased the property. There are three pipes that carried water from the basement of the house, and there are wires coming from the top circular stone as if there might have been a decorative electrical fixture here at some point. Whether this was a grist mill or a fountain, it is made of concrete, which makes you wonder if William F. Laws built it. At any rate, the present owners bought the house in 2010, and as you can see, there were a lot of trees that had to go. It had been used as a rental property for nearly 20 years by that time, including housing for some Manchester Monarchs players. Betsy Price and Paul Van Ass intended to modernize, renovate, and make the home functional while preserving as much of the original character as possible. The house has four bedrooms, two baths, two staircases, including one for the servants, a parlor, a living room, a butler's pantry, and a small closed porch. This is how the kitchen looked when they bought it. Right at this very minute, the kitchen is in the middle of a major renovation, and they stripped it down to this to do their work. The house has a wonderful carriage house that is in the midst of renovation right now as well. Betsy and Paul electrified the building and rebuilt its cupola, adding stairs to the second floor. Inside the house, there are two pocket doors on the first floor, one of which is a double door. All of the rooms feature liberal use of color, especially on the second floor where each room has its own unique character. Original tin ceilings have been preserved in the living room and downstairs bath. Hinges and doorknobs were restored to their previous glory. Betsy and Paul replaced a fence on the north property line, replaced two rotted porches on the same footprints, eliminated knob and tube wiring, and added blown insulation throughout. They completely replaced the front steps. 
the heating system was converted from oil to natural gas and the roofs of the main structure and carriage house were both replaced with architectural shingles and metal painted red to look like the original other projects have included reconstructing the living room fireplace windows were replaced rotted sashes were repaired and beautiful stained glass windows were restored in fact there was a large stained glass window in the front of the house which might look familiar to anyone who's eaten at the Puritan back room because that's where they bought it when the Puritan expanded and was going to throw this away. Where an outside door once stood, there is now a whimsical door to nowhere, decorated in season. And there's even an outdoor play area and a former stump for their granddaughter, Ava. They call this the gnome home. And inside, there is literally a hardwood floor. The Manchester Historic Association is proud to present the Homeowners Award to Betsy Price and Paul Van Ass for their home at 63 North Adams Street. We move from the north end to the east side for tonight's second award. You may know that the original town center back in colonial days in, was in the Hallsville section, an enclave of Scots-Irish families. In those days, what we now call Manchester was known as Derryfield. 
In 1809, John Hall, Jr. built a house on the Mammoth Road, a massive transportation corridor that ran from Concord all the way to Lowell, Massachusetts. The Halls sold their farm to Samuel Jackson in 1819, and he opened a general store in this home to take advantage of travelers on the busy stagecoach route. The building had a meeting hall on the upper floor that he rented out for town meetings, religious gatherings, and the like. Well, in 1831, Jackson was appointed postmaster for the growing Darrowfield community. He set up a post office in the southwest parlor on the ground floor, and it might have stayed there had wealthy Boston merchants not discovered the water power potential of the Merrimack River. While serving as postmaster, Jackson housed the Darrowfield Social Library, a private organization that ran from 1795 to the late 1830s. Tonight's award recipients actually have a book with the emblem that you see on the screen. Jackson resigned as postmaster in 1840, and the newly chartered city of Manchester took shape right along the river. And to some extent, the Mammoth Road post office was forgotten. In December of 1844, the Hall Jackson property was purchased by Isaac Hughes. You've probably driven on the street name for him, Hughes Road. Isaac was a dairy farmer who also raised prize-winning Kentucky thoroughbred racehorses. A prominent citizen on several fronts, he served several terms in the New Hampshire General Court. He also lived a long life, married twice, and fathered several children. In fact, in April 1904, Isaac was honored as one of the oldest citizens of Darrowfield and was even written up for that in the Boston Globe. Well, just two months later, Isaac passed away at the ripe old age of 94, but he didn't have far to go. Isaac is buried in the adjoining Hughes Cemetery, which is right next to his former home. Isaac's son, William, continued to live at 97 Mammoth Road. William was to become the first principal of Hallsville School, about which you'll be hearing more later tonight. Isaac had another son who was also named Isaac. He was principal of the Franklin Street School. The younger Isaac Hughes was also president of the Manchester Historic Association from 1908 to 1910. Tragically, William Hughes died unexpectedly in December 1921, and two months later, so did his brother Isaac. Four years later, another disaster almost destroyed the entire house. On April 28, 1926, fire broke out in the attic of Hughes' house, causing substantial damage. Those were the days before fire codes and sprinklers, and the residents were lucky to get out alive. The fire did leave damage that is still visible today in the attic. The Hughes house stayed in the family for 168 years, passing from generation to generation until the current owners, the Labby family, bought it in 2012. From the beginning, Monique Labby's goal was neither renovation or modernization. As the quintessential steward, she has tried to keep Hughes house as is. This has been extended to the acquisition of a number of antiques, as well as the display of photos of many former residents, even though she isn't one of their blood relatives. Certainly some improvements have been made out of necessity, like a modernized downstairs electrical system. More than 50 bags of asbestos had to be removed from the basement. Note that some of the upstairs rooms still have no electricity at all. Repairs of original horsehair plaster in the kitchen had to be made. The ceiling of the former post office portion of the house collapsed and had to be replaced. Original French block printed wallpaper, vintage 1840 to 1850, was left intact on two walls of that damaged room. The character of the original post office furnishings remains unchanged. A decision was made not to repaint original moldings and faux marble finish in a fireplace mantle. Of course, one of the modern necessities is a laundry room and in this case, a rebuild was necessary. But the modern fluorescent light fixture was replaced with a more turn of the century, 20th century fixture. Incidentally, there are still a number of working push button light switches throughout the house. This award is really a family affair because much of the work was lovingly done by Monique's brother, Joe, with the intention of maintaining the home's historic character. Another Labby brother, Matt, happens to be a professional archaeologist who has spent countless hours inventorying and cataloging thousands of artifacts, documents, and personal letters left behind by the Hughes family. His research led to the Hughes house being accepted on the New Hampshire State Register of Historic Places. Matt has also mapped architectural features within and outside of the house and even employed LIDAR scanning to discover the locations of buried walls and roads. Incidentally, 2019 marks 300 years since the first settlers arrived in the Nutfield Grant, the vast area that became Derry, Londonderry, Windham, and the Derryfield neighbor of Manchester. 
A number of festivities are ongoing this year, including this coming Saturday, when the Hughes House will be open for tours from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. There will be reenactors from the Burlington Minuteman Company, 1732, and an authentic Concord coach will also be on display this Saturday. Please welcome Monique Labby and her brother Matt as we present the Stewardship Award for the Hughes House at 97 Mammoth Road. Our next honoree is something of a Queen City institution. We've learned tonight about the Hallsville neighborhood in East Manchester. Maybe you don't know about Suburban School Number 7 at 786 Massabesic Street, built in 1864, right in the midst of the Civil War. It had 60 students and one teacher, Miss Helenette Colby. Well, Manchester wasn't exactly extravagant in its school expenditures. The 1880 report of the school committee said, quote, an unusually large amount of work has been done in repair and improvement of school buildings, end quote. That included the $15 spent at Hallsville. <laughs> Over time, this original building proved inadequate for the task and was later converted into a firehouse, but today it's recognizable as the East Side Club. Meantime, in 1891, the city built a new two-classroom Hallsville school at 275 Jewett Street at a cost of $15,500. Construction featured a distinctive tower and a gravity-driven clock purchased from E. Howard in Boston. The clock alone cost $1,250. It utilized an eight-foot pendulum swinging at one and a half second intervals and was entirely mechanical. As was common in those days, the clock's chimes summoned pupils to class, signaled the start and end of lunch, and served as timekeeper for the neighborhood. The previously mentioned William H. Hughes was the first principal here in 1892. He was a strict but fair educator who brought all manner of personal papers and learning materials to his classes. His was believed to be the only school in Manchester with an actual skeleton used for instructional purposes. <laughs> and I think, is it true the Labby still own that skeleton? It's no, it went in the trash. Oh. <laughs> Give back the award. <laughs> 
In 1900, Hughes wrote this note to the mother of an underperforming student. Dear Madam, I am sorry to have to report that James' conduct in school is not what it should be. He was made to stand in the floor a while this morning, took the wrong book to study, and as a result did not have his geography lesson. At recess, he ran away. I think he had better stay at home until he is ready to come back and behave as a boy of his age and position in school should. You see Mr. Hughes here with one of his graduating classes. In 1902, the school department report contained a cautionary note about the two primary classrooms of Hallsville School. They contained 66 and 60 students each, or respectively. The gathering of so many pupils into a limited space designed to accommodate from 40 to 48 is a serious menace to health. Proper ventilation is impossible in the best of weather, and in the severe cold of winter, the air becomes extremely foul. Well, in 1908, Hallsville was expanded in a unique way. Workmen literally cut the building in half lengthwise, moving a portion of it 30 feet to the east. That created enough space for four new classrooms, but it caused some structural integrity problems that would come back to haunt decades later. Here you see Principal Hughes with his graduates in the class of 1917. Well, fast forward to 1993. Increased enrollment required a new addition, including a multi-purpose room that could function as both gymnasium and cafeteria. In January 2000, the school library received its own dedicated space. In 2001, Hallsville School received a People's Choice Award during the ninth annual Historic <coughs> Preservation Awards as the city's favorite historic building. A young newspaper reporter named Clayton was the MC of that particular event. <laughs> From 2006 to 2007, a major roof renovation project was undertaken at a price tag of $610,000. Because of damage done back in 1908 when the building was cut in two, rafters and trusses had been severed and the weight load from the clock tower was no longer in balance. The slate roof also needed to be repaired. In 2014, clock expert Phil Devanza of Gosstown was hired to restore the clock, which had been silent by this time for nearly three decades. He lovingly restored the clock hands, repaired many parts, and custom machined others. On April 25th of that year, students and staff gathered for a rededication ceremony. The Manchester Historic Association is pleased to applaud the city landmark known as Hallsville School. Please welcome Principal Christopher McDonald and Assistant Principal Patricia Osher to accept this city landmark award. Which I think it all comes back to the building. 
into building strong bones and uh, what it's meant to the city of Manchester. So I'm very proud of this award. I think it's, uh, it's important that you know, halls will be recognized for what it's done for a city over the test of time. You know, we still have the tin ceilings, we have those wood floors, I mean, the clock tower. It, it's a beautiful place to be, and if anybody ever wants to come visit, it's, it's incredible how we made it technology savvy, but also kept the history of the building. So anytime anyone wants to come see a tour and see what Hallsville has to offer, stop by any time. That kind of gives us a nice transition into our next award, which recognizes the connection between history and education. Mankind's most ancient memories, traditions, stories, and values were handed down at first orally. What the next generation needed to know and remember had to be told to them and memorized. In time, technology shifted the burden from memorization to hieroglyphics and other pictorial symbols that people began to recognize as alphabets. Animal skin parchment and papyrus scrolls made knowledge portable. The printing press made possible mass distribution of ideas and information. Books became the way we preserved history. Further technological advances brought us newspapers, photography, sound recordings, film, and of course broadcasting. And then there's the internet, which has really tied them all together today. Well, Queen City residents are fortunate to have Manchester Public Television Services, Inc., which replaced Manchester Community TV back in February of 1992. A nonprofit 501c3 corporation, MPTS produces public, educational, and government related content for Comcast viewers under contract with the city. Several former mayors serve on the board of directors, and I believe there's at least two of them tonight Silvio Dupuy and Bob Baines, both here. Um, and originally, uh, MPTV provided three channels. Channel 16 is all about education and culture, would broadcast about schools, student sports, ribbon cuttings, municipal events, graduations, and parades. If it happens in City Hall, you'll see it on Channel 22. It broadcasts government-related meetings from the Board of Mayor and Aldermen to the Board of School Committee to various zoning and planning meetings. Channel 23 is Manchester's public access channel, where anyone can learn how to produce and host their own program. In the fall of 2017, MPTS created a fourth outlet, and it's all about history. Channel 97 started with the digitization of more than 40, uh, sorry, 3,500 hours of old videotape and film. This has been the perfect way for the, uh, the perfect collaboration with the Manchester Milliard Museum which is the repository of Manchester's past. And you're supposed to be seeing moving video here right now. You just have to assume that it's there, but I don't think we're going to see it at this point. Apologize for that. For years, MPTS has recorded and rebroadcast historic preservation award ceremony, these events that we've had. But they've also routinely recorded our guest lectures, walking tours, exhibits, and special events. We have the content, and MPTS has the technology to bring it to new audiences. We're also able to share video links on our various social media platforms to further extend the reach of our programs. These days, being relevant is a lot about being where people and their preferred mobile devices are. Thanks to MPTS, the Manchester Historic Association can present the faces and tell the stories of Manchester's past to a contemporary audience. If that wasn't enough, in 2016, MPTS received a federal license for a low-power radio station, WMNH. It regularly promotes MHA programs and has originated broadcast several times from the Milliard Museum. Thus, for having the foresight to look to the past, we are pleased to present this education award to Manchester Public Television Services, Inc., accepting the award as Executive Director, Jason Cody. Considering that's what we do. <laughs> 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 
Um, I just want to first say that uh, I, I want to thank the association for this award. It's amazing. And, uh, it's, it's what we, when we thought about this, the staff sat together, me, Joe Lahr, Brendan McCormick, we wanted to figure out what we wanted to do with this board channel. And we couldn't think of anything better or more important than the history of the city. When you look at all the videos of the, uh, you know, the Civic Center being erected, that's an issue with Rena. Um, you look at the controversies between having a movie theater down in the city in Town Elm Street happened, the discussion happens in 1998, then again in 2004, and then while it just happened to come up again in 2011, you realize how the history of Manchester just unfolds over and over, and we wanted to make sure that everybody in Manchester can see the wonderful things that have happened and how we've come to the place that we are right now, which personally, I've, I've been working here for 20 years and lived in Manchester, uh, or been involved in Manchester for my whole life, and I couldn't be more proud of this community. I love it, and uh, I will always, as long as they're going to have me, I'll be here to, to do so. I wanted to especially thank my board members. They've been amazing since 2010. So between Bob Baines are here, Ray Resort is not, uh, Dave Whibby, and uh, William Cashin as well. And uh, before I leave, I could not uh, express to you enough how important a wonderful staff is, and Brendan McCormick, Kyle Heavey, Joe Lahr especially, um, Peter, Peter White helping with the radio and, and all the wonderful volunteers that help us. Um, we couldn't do everything that we do for Manchester without them, so thank you. Well, our final recipient is a business that opened in 1967. These days it's rare for a business to stay within the same family for 52 years. The story begins with Silvio LeBlanc, who worked at the old Morrow's Hardware before and after his World War II military service. Later, he joined his brother-in-law at Gosselin's Hardware on the west side. Silvio decided to go into business for himself, so he bought out the retiring proprietor of Prue's Hardware and rented space at 156 Wilson Street. LeBlanc's Hardware opened for business on Saturday, June 1, 1967. Coincidentally, just a couple of years later, Cotter & Company opened a massive distribution warehouse on the North Sea side of Manchester Airport in order to distribute True Value products. LeBlanc's became a True Value affiliate in 1970 and had a tremendous competitive advantage being so near its supply warehouse. Then disaster struck. On December 19, 1973, four firefighters were hurt, residents of several apartments were rousted, and flames utterly destroyed the building on Wilson Street. Worst of all, the insurance was not sufficient to cover the loss. For many people, that would have been the end, but not the LeBlanc family. You should know that Silvio and his wife had five children, two girls and three boys. And as each LeBlanc sibling hit the age of 14, they went to work in the family store. After the fire, the LeBlancs bought a property at 252 Jewett Street that had previously housed a radio and TV re repair shop. And here's where the story really gets interesting. Neighbors and customers were so invested in the business that they literally volunteered time and skills to make the necessary renovations, allowing LeBlancs to reopen in the spring of 1974. That kind of customer and neighborhood loyalty continued to the point that a newer, bigger location was needed. So on the 1st of July of 1980, LeBlancs opened shop at its current headquarters, 621 Hayward Street. And today it's run by the second generation of LeBlancs. The staff prides itself on knowing its customers and offering personal and prompt service. Silvio's son, Phil, estimates that LeBlanc stocks more than 25,000 different items and has trained staff who can explain how best to use each one of them. On February 28th of this year, founder Silvio LeBlanc observed his 100th birthday. While <laughs> While vacationing or wintering in Sarasota, however, Silvio fell and injured his hip. And Rob, if we could bring the house lights up. His presence tonight was very much in doubt for a while, but we are very pleased to say that Silvio LeBlanc is with us tonight right at the end of the first section. Happy birthday, Silvio.
So please, join me in congratulating both Silvio on his birthday and the rest of the family and staff at LeBlanc's Hardware as we present this Stewardship of a Family Business Award. Accepting the award is Phil LeBlanc. the Manchester Historical Society for this great honor. People ask us, how can you compete with the big box stores with service, quality merchandise, and a good depth of inventory, but most of all, a sales force of 12 people with over 307 years of, of service and hardware. Our employees are our greatest asset. My mom, dad, and I started this business by taking over an aging hardware store in 1967. We built it up to a thriving business only to be destroyed by a fire in 1973. In 1974, we rose from the ashes on, uh, and moved uh, to Jewett and Hayward Street in Manchester, diagonally across the street from Hallsville School. Isn't it ironic that Hallsville School would be us honored tonight. All of this could not happen without the hard work of my sister Vivian and my sons Matt and Steve. Together, we will continue to serve this great community called Manchester. Thank you. That just about concludes tonight's presentation. Once again, if you are making a donation by cash or check tonight, there is an envelope that was provided in your program booklet, as well as a pen. If you made a pledge and received one of the stars, please redeem that. Just stop at the registration table out in the front lobby as you leave, and be sure to collect your special gift bag. We'd like to thank you all, and don't forget that coffee and dessert is being served next door at Davison Hall. Congratulations to all of our award recipients, and thank you all for supporting the Manchester Historic Association. Thank you.